Hello YouTube! In this video I'm going to introduce the evolutionary debunking argument against moral realism. Uh, now first of all it's worth uh, specifying exactly what moral realism is um, in this context. So uh, I take moral realism to be the view that moral judgments express beliefs, that some of these beliefs are true, and that the truth of these moral beliefs is not dependent on the attitudes or values of any particular person or society. So that is, we might all be wrong about what the moral facts are. Um, a moral realist will say that even if everybody in the world endorsed slavery um, or, or endorsed values or attitudes that uh, you know, were compatible with slavery, slavery would still be wrong. Um, so uh, basically moral realists claim that we have knowledge of stance independent moral facts. Um, I have a whole series on meta-ethics if you want more detail uh, on, on you know, what moral realism is, but you know, hopefully that specifies uh, the, the target of this argument. Now this video is, is long and uh, the arguments are uh, quite tricky I think, so what I've done is made a map of the video to give a, a kind of broad outline of the video. Um, so uh, the way to read this is the video kind of proceeds downwards and each time it splits uh, we'll take the left side first. Um, the evolutionary debunker is in blue and the realist response is in red. Uh, the options under the Darwinian dilemma are in black because they're presented both as a challenge from the debunker but also the realist is going to want to take one of these. Okay so anyway hopefully this will kind of become clear as we go through the video um, but you, you might want to have a, a copy of this. Um, it, it might help in terms of you know following following where the video is going. I'll put a link to the image in the description as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's that's going to work and it'll make things a bit more clear as we go through these arguments. Right, so evolutionary debunking arguments uh, are a type of genealogical debunking argument. In a genealogical debunking argument, we give an explanation for how a belief or set of beliefs came about, and then we try to show that this undermines our reason for thinking that those beliefs are true. So you undermine the justification of a belief by explaining the origin of that belief. Now, there are surely some contexts in which debunking arguments like this are going to be successful. So suppose that I have been reading an ethnography of a small-scale tribe in the Amazon. Um, this has been published by an anthropologist whose work is very well regarded in the field. So as a result of this, I come to hold various beliefs about the tribe. And perhaps these beliefs cohere very nicely with the rest of my web of belief. You know, the, the book's description of the tribe's behavior coheres well with my other beliefs about human behavior. Um, but it's revealed that the book is a fraud. Um, the evidence is found that actually the anthropologist never visited the tribe. You know, he, he confesses to just inventing large parts of the book. So at that point, it, it looks clear that I should give up my beliefs about the tribe because those beliefs are you know, they're, they're based on the book, but the content of the book was an in invention. So there's no reason to think that this book tracks the truth about the real world tribe. The book is, you know, is off track, right? Because it's not, <laughs> it's not based on the real world tribe. It's just based on what the anthropologist came up with in his head. Um, <clears throat> so in general, then, a debunking argument will try to undermine justification for beliefs in a particular domain by showing that those beliefs have been produced by processes that fail to track the truth. So the, the truth of some proposition P plays no role in our explanation of why people formed the belief that P, right? They would believe that P regardless of whether or not P was true. Um, so like if on the basis of the ethnography, I come to believe that the tribe has a yearly ritual where members intentionally sting themselves with fire ants, well, you know, it's, it's possible that that's true just by chance. I mean, like, yeah, maybe, maybe there, maybe this tribe does do that, but clearly the book fails to track the truth. It's not appropriately connected to the facts. So, um, <clears throat> so Guy Kahane in his uh, article on evolutionary debunking arguments states the general structure of a debunking argument like this. First we have a causal premise which says that S's belief that P is explained by X. Then we have an epistemic premise that says X is an off-track process. Uh, X does not track the truth. In the same way that you know that that the the ethnography right doesn't track the truth about uh, the tribe in the Amazon, so we conclude S's belief that P is unjustified. Now, that's the that's the general structure. There is an important qualification to this. 
So presumably, we can always give a causal explanation for any belief. And this explanation can always cite processes that are off track, processes that fail to track the truth. So as Kahane notes, um, there are going to be many causal factors that we could cite in explaining why Einstein uh, came up with the theory of relativity. Um, so this was dependent on Einstein choosing to study physics rather than music. It was dependent on Einstein having enough food and resources to stay alive long enough to come up with the theory, um, and so on. Uh, in fact, the, you know, the vast majority of causal factors leading to the proposal of the theory have nothing to do with the truth of the theory itself. So for a successful debunking argument, it's not enough just to cite processes that are not truth tracking. Um, the explanation has to leave no room for the truth tracking processes. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's like the complete explanation must fail to cite such processes. That's the difference between Einstein's relativity theory and the case of the fictional ethnography. Right? Once we explain the fictional ethnography as being an invention, right, we, there's just no room there for uh, truth tracking processes. Um, it, it, for, for that to be like appropriately connected to the facts of the case about the tribe. So um, that's the general structure of debunking arguments. Now, in metaethics, there is a popular kind of debunking argument, the evolutionary debunking argument. And Kahane summarizes it uh, sort of as follows. So again, we have the causal premise, which says that our evolutionary history explains why we have the moral beliefs we have. We have the epistemic premise, which is that evolution is not truth tracking with respect to the moral facts. So our moral beliefs are not justified. So uh, the empirical claim here is that our capacity for moral thinking is a product of evolution, right? We can give an explanation appealing to our evolutionary history, which accounts for, you know, why we make moral judgments and why we endorse the kind of moral norms that we do. Now, there is uh, a lot of debate about the empirical details here. There are lots of different hypotheses about the origin of our moral norms. Um, so, you know, so some people are going to say that m moral thinking is an adaptation. Others argue it wasn't directly selected for, but is a byproduct of other adaptations. Um, you know, some will reject the idea that it's, you know, that, that the evolutionary explanation is appropriate, right? Maybe this is maybe like a cultural explanation or something. But, you know, so like anything we say to fill in the causal premise is going to be controversial. But it seems, I mean, I, I suppose pretty plausible that evolutionary history has played a significant role in shaping our moral judgments. Um, and the claim is that the moral facts, the moral truth, are completely irrelevant to this. Evolutionary processes um, do not track the moral facts. They're not sensitive to the moral facts. Um, so let's explain this in a, in a bit more detail so that we can see how this is supposed to work. Um, in fact, we can distinguish sort of two ways to run the evolutionary debunking argument. So one option is to say, uh, is to sort of target uh, the general capacity for moral thinking, right? So in this case, the causal premise will give an explanation of why we frame anything in moral terms. Um, the debunking argument would then be that we would have developed a tendency to think in moral terms regardless of whether there are any moral facts. Um, and then second, we might target our specific moral beliefs, the specific norms that we hold. Uh, here, the causal premise will give an explanation for the like content of our moral norms, right? So we would have developed something like the moral norms that we have, regardless of what the moral facts are. So let's consider the first line. Um, so we can give explanations of the general capacity for moral judgment. One popular idea here, although it is just one idea, is that morality is a costly signaling device. Humans are social creatures. We benefit enormously from cooperation and it promotes my survival and reproduction if people trust me as a partner in cooperative projects. Projects like hunting, fishing, raising a family, that requires other people to work with me. And people will prefer to work with those who will be strongly committed to whatever project they're doing. Those who can be trusted to see it through to its end and those who can be trusted to reciprocate. So as a result, I need some way to signal my commitment to such projects. Signaling Signaling one's, you know, cooperative, pro-social commitments is adaptive. Now, um, there's a, a sort of general principle, uh, you know, in, <clears throat> in evolutionary theory that costly signals are honest signals because 
the profits to be gained by a dishonest signal would not be worth the cost, would not be worth the risk of producing it. Um, morality is a costly signal because adherence to moral norms often requires sacrificing one's immediate personal interests. So other people will tend to select partners who make these costly signals uh, and this promotes the survival and reproduction of those who make those signals. And this explains why humans think in moral terms. It explains why the, you know, the moral capacity or the moral module evolved. Um, but this explanation does not require us to suppose that any moral judgments are true. Uh, it, it provides a, a kind of an explanation, a complete explanation for the origin of moral thinking without appealing to the truth of any particular moral judgments, right? Moral truth is just completely irrelevant to this. Um, let's consider the second line then, uh, where we target our, the actual moral norms that we hold. So the thought is that the moral judgments that a person makes, the specific moral judgments a person makes, will significantly influence their chances of survival and reproduction. Imagine somebody who takes uh, the fact that some action A would threaten their survival as a reason to do A, or as a reason for thinking that A is morally good. Or imagine if they uh, take the fact that some person is a close relative to be a reason to harm that person. Well, those, those judgments would obviously reduce their reproductive success. Uh, people who make judgments like that will be eliminated. Um, so over our evolutionary history, there was pressure on our ancestors to uh, produce the kind of evaluative judgments that promoted survival and reproduction. Um, now, as Sharon Street notes in her article, A Darwin Darwinian Dilemma for Realist Theories of Value, it's unlikely that any specific moral judgment was um, directly selected for. So Street says, and I quote, the capacity for full-fledged evaluative judgment was a relatively late evolutionary add-on superimposed on top of much more basic behavioral and motivational tendencies. Full-fledged moral judgments are probably not heritable, right? Like, you, you know, you can't, you can't encode a moral judgment like you ought to help people who help you. You can't encode that into the genes. Um, these probably aren't the sorts of things that are heritable, so they're not going to be the target of selection. W what is plausibly heritable are what Street calls basic evaluative tendencies. Um, so these are unreflective, non-linguistic, motivational tendencies to experience particular states of affairs as, as calling for particular responses. Um, when an animal perceives a threat to its offspring, such as a, th a predator threatening its offspring, it sees this as calling for a protective response, um, and that motivates it to protect its offspring. Or at least that's what usually happens. I mean, you know, you know obviously there are plenty of cases where it doesn't happen, but you know, we can we can find that among many animals, right? That uh, that protective response being called for. So these basic evaluative tendencies are plausibly the target of selection. Um, they are plausibly heritable, and they seem to make a difference to reproductive success. <clears throat> and then the thought is that our moral judgments are built on the foundation of these basic evaluative tendencies. Our basic evaluative tendencies provide uh, the starting point for moral reasoning. Um, now, of course, <clears throat> there are plenty of other factors that influence our full-fledged moral judgments, um, various facts about you know, our culture, environment, personal idiosyncrasies, that's going to lead people with the same basic evaluative tendencies to different moral conclusions. Um, so, for instance, it may be that everybody has some basic tendency to favour their close relatives as a result of kin selection. Uh, well, a lot of people deny that family connections are ultimately morally relevant. Utilitarians deny this. Um, but but, I mean, the argument would be that even utilitarians um, are going to be appealing to other basic evaluative tendencies, such as that suffering is bad or we ought to help people in need, right? So, you, you know, al although we might not, you know, we, we can kind of criticise some of our tendencies, right? Moral thinking is going to be appealing. It's, it's going to be kind of built on the foundation of basic evaluative tendencies. Had we evolved differently, um, our basic evaluative tendencies would be different, and so our full-fledged moral judgments would similarly be different. Uh, Street gives uh, a few examples. She says, you know, suppose we had evolved a social system more like lions. Male lions tend to form polygynous harems with 
lots of females. Uh, males experience the basic tendency to kill offspring that are not their own. And females, instead of holding it against a male that kills her offspring, uh, she will instead have the basic tendency to become more receptive to his advances. So, you know, imagine if humans had, had uh, developed a social system like this, if we had evolved um, in a context like this. Um, if we had developed a social system like these lines, it, you know, along these lines, our moral judgments would likely differ pretty significantly. Or consider the, uh, the eusocial insect colonies. Uh, had we developed in this kind of way, we would experience the strong tendency to devote ourselves entirely to the community. There would be very little inclination to care about individual survival for its own sake. Um, so, uh, you know, so that, that seems, I suppose, you know, reasonably plausible, right? You know, we, we look around the animal kingdom and we find like different, uh, different social systems, different, different species have very different basic evaluative tendencies. So the general picture then is, is this. Um, the hypotheses that explain the origin of our capacity for moral judgment or the content of moral norms, they don't suppose that it enhanced fitness or that those norms enhanced fitness by delivering true moral judgments. When biologists and psychologists explain the origin of our moral norms, they don't, they don't need to suppose that there's any actual rightness or wrongness or good or bad existing in the world of our ancestors um, that, that those norms evolved to track. So the truth of our moral judgments plays no role in the explanation of why we form those moral judgments. If it were the case that violence and suffering and selfishness are good, while pleasure and cooperation are bad, we would still believe the opposite because you know, because it's those beliefs that promote survival and reproduction. If it were the case that it is, you know, that it is good to kill one's offspring or to kill um, unrelated offspring, um, we would still believe that that's bad because given the sort of social system in which we evolved, right, it, that's, that does not promote survival and reproduction. Um, you know, I mean, also, to, I guess, put it the other way around, right? Like, we think killing offspring is bad, but lions still have a basic evaluative tendency to favour killing offspring in certain circumstances because that promotes survival and reproduction. Um, Sharon Street gives a, a nice summary of the situation. <clears throat> she says, Our system of evaluative judgments is revealed to be utterly saturated and contaminated with illegitimate uh, influence. We should have been evolving towards affirming the independent evaluative truths posited by the realist, but instead it turns out that we have been evolving towards affirming whatever evaluative content tends to promote reproductive success. We have thus been guided by the wrong sort of influence from the very outset of our evaluative history. And so, more likely than not, most of our evaluative judgments have nothing to do with the truth. So that's the basic idea of the evolutionary debunking argument. Now, there's an immediate concern about this argument, which is, well, if we find this kind of argument persuasive, isn't this just going to lead to a kind of global scepticism? Isn't this just going to generalise to all of our beliefs? Because our cognitive capacities in general are products of evolution, not just moral thinking, but perception, memory, mathematical reasoning, right? These all have an evolutionary history as well. So, you know, we can just say with all of these, like, we developed these capacities because they promoted survival and reproduction, not because they tracked the truth. Uh, if, e if the evolutionary influence on some belief forming capacity leads to scepticism about the reliability of that capacity, then we can't trust any of our beliefs. We're committed to radical scepticism. Um, so what the evolutionary debunker will say to this is that there are certain traits like cognitive traits or cognitive capacities that function to track the truth because tracking the truth in particular domains promotes survival and reproduction or did promote survival and reproduction among our ancestors. For some capacities that produce representational states, success at truth tracking explains why those capacities arose and persisted. Uh, Richard Joyce gives the example of mathematics. So plausibly, humans evolved the ability to know basic arithmetic. For instance, um, like basic facts like two plus three equals five. 
having this proposition available immediately without needing to perform difficult calculations would have been beneficial. So let's say you see two lions enter a cave followed by three lions. Well, if you know two plus three equals five, you now know there are five lions in the cave. Then when you see five lions exit, oh, you know the cave is empty, it's safe to enter. I mean, that's a simple example, right? But this is a kind of thing that it might be useful to know. But notice that the belief that two plus three equals five, that only confers any benefit because the belief is true. The, the explanation for why our capacity for basic arithmetic promotes survival and reproduction has to appeal to true belief in the facts of arithmetic. Um, like suppose somebody believed two plus three equals four instead. Well, that would cause a host of problems. That would be actively disadvantageous. They see two lions enter the cave followed by three lions. Then they see four lions leave and so they conclude the cave is empty. That's disastrous. So uh, our arithmetical beliefs need to be true in order to be useful. And that means we have reason to think that our faculty for basic arithmetic tracks the truth uh, because accurate representation of arithmetical facts promotes survival and reproduction. The fact that two plus three equals five, that you know, if you have two objects and three objects, you take them together, you have five objects, that plays an important role in explaining why we now make the judgment that two plus three equals five. And arguably we can extend the same sort of idea to other kinds of beliefs, such as beliefs based on perception. It's advantageous to grasp truths about one's observable surroundings, uh, like is there a raging fire nearby? How slippery are the rocks near the sea? In what direction is that animal moving? You know, these kinds of things. Holding beliefs about these things promotes one's survival and reproduction, but only if those beliefs are actually true, or at least close enough to the truth. If I believe the animal is moving to the left when it's actually moving to the right, that's not going to put me at any advantage. The evolutionary story we tell about why we hold perceptual beliefs presupposes that, at least in certain contexts, perception is reasonably accurate. But the evolutionary debunker will say, this kind of thing just don't work in the case of morality. Uh, our our mathematical and perceptual beliefs need to be true, or at least true in certain respects, in order to be useful. They need to track the facts. Moral beliefs, by contrast, do not need to be true in order to be useful. If morality evolved as a costly signaling device, or it evolved to promote cooperation or whatever, well, it can play those roles regardless of the moral facts. From the point of view of the evolutionary story, it makes no difference what the moral facts are. We, we would have evolved the same way, we would have had the same basic evaluative tendencies, whatever, whatever those facts are. Um, okay, so uh, that maybe deals with that problem. <coughs> now, um, Sharon Street has famously put the evolutionary debunking argument in the form of a dilemma for moral realists. She calls it the Darwinian dilemma. Um, actually, Street's argument is a bit more general than this. She targets realism about evaluative, evaluative judgments in general, not just moral judgments, but, you know, we're focusing on morality here. Okay, so our, our um, moral attitudes have been shaped by evolutionary forces, and I mean, we've just seen uh, earlier, you know, we, we saw you know, some stories about how that might work. Um, <clears throat> now, the realist must give some account of the relation between these evolutionary influences on our moral attitudes and the stance-independent moral facts that the realist believes in. And this leads to a dilemma. The realist has two options. So option number one is she can hold that there is no relation between the evolutionary influences on our moral beliefs and the stance-independent moral facts. Second, she could uh, say that there is a relation, that natural selection has favoured those of our ancestors that were capable of grasping the moral facts. Both of these options, Street thinks, uh, hold problems for the realist. So let's take them in turn. We'll begin with uh, option number one. So the realist can deny that there is a relation. This amounts to just accepting the epistemic premise of the debunking argument, uh, accepting that evolution is not truth tracking with respect to moral facts. In this case, then, uh, the argument will be there's no reason um, to think that natural selection has pushed us in the direction of moral truths. Uh, we have no grounds for supposing that our moral beliefs are true. Um, Street gives the analogy that it's, it's like setting out on a boat to get to Bermuda, 
but allowing one's course to be determined by whatever way the wind and the tide happen to push you. Now, of course, you might get lucky. Um, you might just by chance end up at Bermuda. Similarly, natural selection might occasionally produce basic evaluative tendencies that are in accordance with the stance-independent moral facts, but it's pure luck. Um, it, it would be a remarkable coincidence if any large proportion of our moral beliefs were true. Um, I mean, again, like consider again the kind of evaluative judgments that a society of intelligent creatures descended from lions or bees might make. They would be very, very different from the evaluative judgments we make, and that. I, mean, I guess that shows just how broad the universe of possible evaluative judgments is. It would be extremely unlikely to hit just by chance on the true evaluative judgments. So by denying a relation between the evolutionary influences on our moral beliefs on the one hand and stance independent moral facts on the other, by denying any relation, it looks like we're just left with moral skepticism. Um, we just have to say our capacity for making moral judgments is unreliable. Right? We just don't know what the moral facts are. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, obviously realists do not want to be committed to moral scepticism. Uh, so, what might they say in response to this? Um, well, first, the realist can point out that our moral judgments are influenced not just by evolutionary pressures, but also by rational reflection. <clears throat> common sense moral judgments have changed significantly over human history and I mean even today different societies hold different different moral norms and this is a this is often a result of weighing up reasons for and against different moral theories engaging in moral argument moral reasoning um, we don't just endorse whatever our basic evaluative tendencies are um, so, for instance, we've seen what Peter Singer has called the expanding circle of moral concern. In the past, people felt obligations to members of their tribe, and then this expanded to members of the nation, then it expanded to uh, members of their class and race, and then it expanded to all of humanity. Maybe in the future it expands to include animals. Um, this kind of thing is a result of recognizing that certain distinctions between entities are morally irrelevant, right? So there's, there's moral reasoning, right, that gets us to moral truth. To take the Bermuda analogy, well, even though the wind and the tide have no tendency to take us in the direction of Bermuda, if we use tools like the compass and we use a method for steering the boat, then we can reliably make our way there. Along the same lines, right, we're not just kind of condemned to whatever basic evaluative tendencies evolution has inculcated us with, right, we have rational reflection and that might get us to the moral facts, even if natural selection is not truth tracking with respect to the moral facts. So, so there doesn't need to be any relation between the evolutionary influences and the moral facts because rational reflection can do the work. Well, Street objects to this response. The problem, she says, is that rational reflection can only work by assessing some moral judgments in terms of others. We can't simply stand outside the moral point of view and then sort through all our moral judgments, selecting the true and discarding the false. Obviously, reflection doesn't work like that. Instead, we have to proceed from some moral theory that we accept or from certain basic moral intuitions. And we then assess other moral judgments in those terms. I mean, just think about how philosophers actually go about arguing what is the right moral theory. They don't, like, you know, as it were, stand outside of morality. Rather, they test moral theories against moral intuitions about particular cases, they test their internal consistency, they um, consider how different views of the empirical facts would lead to different obligations in light of the theory and so on. So the point then is that if we can't trust our evaluative judgments, then we can't trust rational reflection to correct our course. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of a, like a garbage in, garbage out problem, right? Um, like if, if you just, rational reflection is working with some evaluative judgments, right? If you can't trust them, then you can't trust that it's going to get you to the truth. So uh, it may be that, as Street puts it, all our reflection over the ages has really just been a process of assessing evaluative judgments that are mostly off the mark in terms of others that are mostly off the mark. And that's not going to be reliable. Rational reflection is only reliable if you have reliable starting points, but the evolutionary debunking argument undermines 
our confidence in those starting points. So that's that's a worry. But perhaps perhaps that understates the power of rational reflection. Uh, so one uh, interesting idea noted by Michael Humer in the article Revisionary Intuitionism um, suggests that actually uh, the, the problem isn't so bad, right? So um, it doesn't really matter if our basic evaluative tendencies are unreliable. It, you know, even if most of the starting points are false, we actually can still reliably reason to the moral truth by finding the most coherent theory. Humor gives the analogy of witness testimony. Suppose that a bank robbery has taken place and six independent people claim to have seen the getaway car's license plate. Unfortunately, not all of their reports agree. However, two of them report the same license plate number, uh, while the other four give different license plate numbers. Well, now it's extremely improbable that two independent witnesses would report the same license plate number unless that number were actually correct. So <clears throat> we can take it that this is the correct plate, despite the fact that most of the reports are mistaken, despite the fact that eyewitness testimony is, in this context at least, unreliable. Um, so similarly, suppose that only one third of our moral intuitions are accurate. So you know our basic moral faculty is not in general reliable. Even so, um, we may be able to reliably identify the moral facts by considering coherence relations. The correct moral intuitions will tend to be those that cohere with each other, while we should expect no coherence to hold among the incorrect intuitions. The incorrect intuitions, you know, like they're, they're going to be, you know, kind of random in the way that the other four eyewitness reports would be. So maybe that works. I mean, I must say, I'm, I, 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 I'm not sure I find uh, Humer's analogy entirely convincing. Um, so I, I think uh, actually the analogy is sort of underspecified, right? Like if we're imagining a situation in which <clears throat> people, report, people reported completely different number plates while two people reported the same, I would probably assume that, you know, okay, those two people saw the same plate, but I wouldn't assume that that number plate was the number plate of the getaway car. An alternative hypothesis could be that there are many cars that appeared to be the getaway car. Uh, maybe the criminals intentionally had other cars there identical to their getaway car to mislead people. So the six witnesses saw different cars. That would strike me as a plausible explanation. And it points to one of the problems with this analogy, which is that there are other ways of accounting for coherence. Right, tracking the truth is not the only way to account for coherence. Um, from the evolutionary point of view, we would not expect our intuitions, our moral intuitions, to be completely random. Natural selection will push our moral intuitions, our basic evaluative tendencies, in particular directions, namely the directions that promote survival and reproduction. Given that all humans have specific physical and mental capacities, we require specific resources and you know, specific environmental conditions to survive and reproduce, it's not surprising that specific moral norms would be selected. Um, and I mean, like, in, again, like, even if you're a realist, you should probably accept this, right? Like, because um, even a realist is going to acknowledge that, yeah, like, w people have all sorts of biases that, you know, mislead them, right? It's not, it's not like natural selection is perfectly reliable. Nobody would, it doesn't perfectly track the moral truth. Nobody's going to claim that. Um, but when you look at the sort of, biases that people have, they're not completely random, right? So, yeah, I, I think with respect to the, the Darwinian dilemma, the no relation option has some problems. <clears throat> okay, let's turn to the second horn of Street's dilemma. Here, the realist will claim that there is a relation between the evolutionary influences on our moral beliefs and the stance-independent moral truths. Um, in particular, natural selection favoured those of our ancestors who were able to grasp the moral truths. So it's not that we were, you know, just by chance, uh, like selected to have generally correct moral beliefs. We didn't just get lucky. Uh, there's some connection between the moral facts on the one hand and the selective forces that produced our, evalu uh, our basic evaluative judgments on the other. Now, there are two ways to take this kind of option. The first and simplest way is to hold that the ability to grasp moral truths in itself confers a reproductive advantage. Detecting moral truths is somehow advantageous just in itself. 
we can call this the direct tracking account. The basic problem with this, Street thinks, is that the most plausible explanations of the evolution of our moral faculties just don't make any reference to purported moral facts. Um, so, you know, it's, it's advantageous for a person to believe that they ought to take care of their offspring, that they ought to behave cooperatively and so on, if the moral facts are otherwise. If we, if we had a moral obligation to kill our offspring instead, that would make no difference. Um, the moral beliefs would have evolved in, you know, in, in the same way. Or like another, I mean, so, I mean, maybe another way to put this is just, like, recall the explanations that were given earlier of the origin of, you know, our moral capacity or the particular moral norms that we hold. Um, right, they, th those explanations just don't make reference to the moral facts. Um, all we need to account for the evolution of morality is what Street calls the adaptive link account. So on this account, there are certain basic evaluative tendencies that were favoured, and I quote, not because they constituted perceptions of independent evaluative truths, but because they forged adaptive links between our ancestors' circumstances and their responses to those circumstances, getting them to act, feel, and believe in ways that turned out to be reproductively advantageous. The tendency to promote the welfare of close kin, or the tendency to cooperate with those who will reciprocate, plus the tendency to punish those who don't, these will promote reproductive success. Now, when we look at these sort of evaluative tendencies, the question is, okay, what's the best explanation for why a given evaluative tendency arose? Right? What's the best explanation for why we value, for instance, survival? Well, the direct tracking account says something like this. The direct tracking account says, it stands independently true that survival is valuable, and recognizing this truth, caused us to act in ways that promote survival, and this promoted reproductive success. But we have a much more straightforward hypothesis available, which is just people who value survival tend to act in ways that promote survival, and that promotes reproductive success. Um, the adaptive link account is more parsimonious. Uh, the direct tracking account posits independent evaluative facts, and then some mechanism for recognizing such facts, and then that's what promotes reproductive success. <clears throat> the adaptive link account explains the advantage of basic evaluative tendencies more simply and more directly. And I mean, that's what you're actually going to find. Like, if you read, you know, biologists and psychologists and so on giving explanations, right, they don't postulate independent evaluative truths in their explanations. <clears throat> there is another problem with the direct tracking account, which is that, in fact, realists will surely want to say there are plenty of cases where there is no reproductive advantage in grasping the moral truths. Our evolutionary history has left, it with, left us with a whole load of biases, as I mentioned earlier. For example, Street notes that humans have a general tendency for in-group bias. We divide people up into groups, those with whom we identify and those groups that we do not identify with, and if somebody is a member of an out-group, they are seen as worthy of lesser treatment. In many societies, the out-group has been accorded no rights at all. Uh, they've been, you know, enslaved, uh, killed, raped, you know, like, just sometimes seen as worse than animals, you know. Now, the adaptive link account gives us a straightforward explanation of this kind of thing. If I have a dis disposition to act preferentially to my in-group, I will assist those who are more likely to share my genes and those who are more likely to reciprocate in the future. Because, like, again, you know, if I'm if I'm assisting those who are in my tribe, right, then I'm interacting with people who I'm going to interact with again in the future, so they're more likely to reciprocate, right? So preferential treatment of my in-group um, is reproductively advantageous. On the direct tracking account, well, you know, what, what would the direct tracking account say about this? The direct tracking account would have to say, this evaluative disposition arose because it is true that the in-group is deserving of, of preferential treatment. There is some stance-independent moral fact to the effect that the in-group is deserving of preferential treatment, and recognition of this truth somehow conferred reproductive advantage. But of course, a lot of realists aren't going to want to say that. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of people will say, actually, no, right? The, the, the idea that like, in-group bias, right, that's something that we should resist. A lot of people will want to say that. Um, so what this means is that, you know, the direct tracking account um, ends up being kind of bifurcated, right? Like there are going to be m many basic evaluative tendencies where the direct tracking account just doesn't apply. Um, so it's 
it's not, it doesn't have such broad explanatory scope, right? The direct tracking account can only apply to those basic evaluative tendencies that we think do, you know, that we think are in line with the moral facts. But there are going to be plenty of basic evaluative tendencies that, that aren't. Um, so again, <clears throat> the adaptive link account, right, is just a better explanation because it has broader scope, right? It's, it's, it doesn't have to kind of um, restrict its scope in that sort of ad hoc way. Okay, so if the direct tracking account is rejected, there is, uh, there is another alternative. There is another alternative for people who want to take the second horn of streets dilemma and uh, claim that there is a relation, um, that claim that natural selection favoured those of our ancestors who could grasp the moral truths. And this alternative we can call the indirect tracking account. This is also known as uh, the third factor response. And this is, I think, probably the most popular realist response to the evolutionary debunking argument. So there's a distinction between selection of a trait and selection for a trait. Blood is red and the redness of blood is a product of natural selection. Um, organisms have blood and blood has the properties that it does as a result of selection. Um, well, presumably. I mean, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's other things than selection in there, but like, you know, certainly like evolution, right? But, you know, blood was not selected for redness. Uh, presumably the colour of blood makes no difference with respect to survival and reproduction. The colour of blood was selected as a byproduct of properties that it was selected for, right? So, you know, what was it selected for? Well, it was selected for carrying oxygen or, you know, whatever. Um, the colour of blood is a byproduct of that. Another example, whale blubber is extremely flammable, but it was not selected for this quality. It was selected for its insulating quality. Flammability was selected, but not selected for. Okay, so we can apply the same idea in the moral domain. Our basic evaluative judgments are mostly true. There was no selection for the capacity of evaluative judgment to track the moral fact, but this may still be selected as a byproduct of features that were selected for. This is, um, so this is called the third factor account because the idea is that there is some third factor that is adaptive, so we evolved to track this third factor, but this third factor correlates with the moral facts. So the capacity for moral judgment, um, or you know our specific moral norms, that didn't those didn't evolve in order to track the moral facts, right? That's not what mor morality was selected for. Nevertheless, our moral judgments do in fact track the moral facts due to the connection between the third factor and the moral facts. Right. I mean, I, this maybe is. Uh, you know, we got very, very abstract and perhaps a bit confusing. So let's take some specific examples of this, which hopefully will um, illustrate how this is supposed to work. There are many ways of developing this kind of idea. There are many different third factor responses. So I'm just going to mention two. Um, one idea comes from David Enoch in his article, The Epistemological Challenge to Metanormative Realism. Enoch starts from the assumption that survival and reproduction are pro tanto good. They're good to some extent in most cases. They're not always good, of course, but they're good generally speaking. Natural selection favours that which promotes survival and reproduction. So that which natural selection favours is somewhat good. It's pro tanto good. Um, I mean, this is something that most moral realists are going to believe. Moral realists will think that survival and reproduction are generally good things. Now, the evolutionary debunker comes along and says, hey, selection has influenced our basic evaluative tendencies so as to promote survival and reproduction, not to track the truth. But, but hang on a minute, right? Promoting survival and reproduction, well, those are pro tanto good. So our moral judgments will have a tendency to track what's good. Uh, as, you know, so as Enoch says, survival is good. So behaving in ways that promote it is pro tanto good. One efficient way of pushing us in the direction of acting in those ways is by pushing us to believe that it is good to act in those ways. And then, you know, since it is in fact good, generally speaking, to act in those ways, the moral beliefs produced by our evaluative capacity will tend to be true. Now, the truth of our moral beliefs does not explain why they were adaptive, but nevertheless, they are true. Uh, there's no, there's no direct selection for believing the moral facts. This is a happy byproduct of the fact that evolution tracks something that correlates with the moral facts. Evolution is, is not terribly off track. Now, this doesn't vindicate all moral knowledge, but it doesn't need to. Um, so, like, 
What this shows is that evolution is not terribly off track with respect to moral truth. Uh, the, the evolutionary influences incline us to have basic evaluative tendencies that point in the right direction. And yes, there are going to be biases and faulty tendencies as well. But as long as we're not terribly off track, then reasoning can, you know, can, can, can like help us gain access to the truths. So by eliminating inconsistencies, eliminating arbitrary distinctions, working through analogies, we're going to get closer and closer to the moral facts. We can be confident that reasoning will work because we can be confident that our starting points, the basic evaluative tendencies, are not too far off the mark. When we discussed the first horn of Street's dilemma, we saw that reasoning wasn't enough, right? Because, because if, if you're saying there's like no relation, well, we can have no confidence in the starting points. But on this approach, if Enoch is right, we can have some confidence in them. So even though it's not perfect, right, re reasoning can um, like kick in and get us to the moral truth. So we can be uh, confident uh, in our moral beliefs. Another idea along the same lines is given by David Kopp in his article Darwinian Skepticism about Moral Realism. Kopp defends what he calls the society-centered moral theory. According to this theory, the correct moral norms are those that help societies meet their needs. Humans are social creatures. We, we need to live in societies, but due to scarcity of resources and conflicts of interest, we are, you know, we, we're going to come into conflict with other people. So societies need mechanisms for encouraging peaceful cooperative interactions. The way societies do this is by enforcing moral norms, a shared moral code. The function of morality then is to enable societies to meet their needs of stability, peacefulness and cooperation. And morality does this by providing rules that when followed motivate such behaviour. The general idea then is societies with moral codes do better at promoting cooperation, avoiding conflict, allowing their members to meet their needs. And some moral codes are better than others at serving this function. On this theory, a moral proposition is true and I quote, only if the moral code that would best serve the function of enabling society to meet its needs included or entailed a relevantly corresponding norm. Take the proposition torture is wrong. Well, that's true just in case the moral code that best enables societies to meet their needs of social stability, peacefulness and cooperation includes a prohibition on torture. Okay, now, with that, with that in the background then, well, it's very plausible that natural selection has favoured the development of basic evaluative tendencies that support cooperative pro-social norms, right? Like, like the, the, the altruistic cooperative dispositions would have been adaptive in ancestral environments. Again, because humans, humans are social. We rely on working with each other in order to meet our own individual needs. There are going to be a, a whole range of situations where cooperative agents do better than purely selfish ones. Um, so, you know, we, we then evolved like positive attitudes to cooperative behavior and we enforced norms that encourage such behavior. The basic evaluative tendencies predicted by evolutionary theory, therefore point in the direction of the moral truths. Again, not perfectly reliably, but reliably enough that with reflection and moral theorizing, we can get closer to the moral truth over time. Cultural evolution will lead to further refinements of the norms and again, you know, these are going to be favouring norms that enhance the ability of societies to meet their needs. Societies that are stable, cooperative and peaceful tend to do better, so they're likely to transmit their norms to other societies. Um, and so, you know, in, in that way, over time, right, you know, we get closer and closer to the moral truth. Uh, basically, I, I mean, so I guess, like, you know, what's going on here is, right, that, so the, the judgment, the, the, the evaluative judgment that cooperation is good, that would be favoured by natural selection, because this judgment promotes cooperation and cooperation promotes fitness. But cooperation also promotes peace and well-being. Um, you know, it's a crucial part of helping societies to meet their needs. So what we have is that the fact that cooperation promotes fitness, that explains why it was favoured by natural selection. The fact that cooperation promotes well-being, that's at least part of what explains why cooperation is morally good. So, you know, we have a third factor that is correlated with the moral facts. Okay, hopefully that illustrates how these third factor uh, responses are supposed to work. Now, there is a general worry about 
any kind of third factor response, which may have occurred to you. Um, so what we see when we look at uh, Enoch and Cop's uh, responses is that they begin by assuming certain substantive moral claims. Um, you know, Enoch assumes that survival is pro tanto good. But you might think, well, doesn't this just beg the question? I mean, the anti-realist has presented an argument that casts doubt on the justification of our moral beliefs. And then in response to the argument, <laughs> like the, the third factor response assumes the truth of certain moral beliefs. Isn't that question begging? Well, it's important to bear in mind how the evolutionary debunking argument works. The evolutionary debunking argument, it, it, it's not designed to show that there are no moral facts or that our moral beliefs are false. What it shows, if it's successful at least, is that our moral beliefs are unjustified. It shows that even if there are moral facts, we don't have moral knowledge. That's the conclusion of the debunking argument. And that's a conditional claim. Right? Like, even if there are moral facts, we don't have moral knowledge. Now, if the third factor response is successful, what it shows is that, actually, if there are moral facts, we do have moral knowledge. Right? So it shows how, right, given that there are moral facts, we can plausibly track the moral facts. Um, in targeting the evolutionary debunker's conditional claim, it's perfectly legitimate to assume the antecedent, right? to assume that there are moral facts, and then show that the consequent does not follow. And in giving an explanation of how we might be able to track the moral facts, it's legitimate to assume that there are moral facts. At least that's not obviously question begging, or so the third factor realist will say. Uh, however, you know, I mean, the argument gets sort of, I guess, a little bit tricky here, right? So the, <clears throat> the debunker might object that this still doesn't really solve the problem. So we can grant that it's legitimate in responding to the debunking argument. We can grant it's legitimate for the realist to assume that there are moral facts. But it's not so obvious that it's legitimate for the realist to assume the content of any particular moral theory. Um, again, third factor responses, they don't, they don't just assume that there are moral facts, right? They assume substantive moral claims, claims like survival is pro tanto good. What's driving the debunker's worry here is that once we see that we don't need to postulate moral facts in order to account for the development of our basic evaluative capacities, um, and once we you know, rule out the direct tracking account, that raises a question about the epistemic status of our basic evaluative tendencies. Do our basic evaluative tendencies indirectly track the facts, or are they just completely off track? Well, having raised that question, it's no good testing our basic evaluative tendencies against our actual moral judgments, because our moral judgments are derived from those basic evaluative tendencies. I mean, there'd be no way for the basic evaluative tendencies to fail that test. Um, so uh, Justin Horn, in his article, Evolution and the Epistemological Challenge to Moral Realism, gives the following analogy. He says, suppose you have been brainwashed by a uh, cult leader who has inculcated a whole bunch of supernatural beliefs in you, beliefs about gods and spirits and souls. These beliefs are based on visions that the cult leader experienced when taking a miracle drug. And you then wonder, you know, okay, are the miracle drug visions a reliable guide to supernatural truth? Uh, after all, it looks like we can account for, you know, the content of these visions without postulating a realm of supernatural facts that those visions correctly track. Um, you know, that there are other, there are going to be other ways of explaining why those visions occurred. Um, well, it's not going to help here to test the miracle drug visions against your own beliefs about the supernatural, because your own beliefs about the supernatural were inculcated during the cult leader's brainwashing. Your supernatural beliefs do not form an independent test of the miracle drug visions. The visions are bound to be confirmed when tested against your supernatural beliefs, because your supernatural beliefs are based on those visions. So that would be, you know, that's, in that situation, it seems clear that like it, it would be kind of begging the question, right? To just say, well, you know, like to just assume um, one's supernatural beliefs in testing whether or not the miracle drug visions are reliable. And Horn says the same problem occurs for these third factor responses. Um, our basic evaluative tendencies are inculcated by evolution and the evolutionary explanation for our basic evaluative tendencies doesn't appeal to moral facts. So then we wonder right, whether our moral beliefs based on these basic evaluative tendencies are reliable. The third factor response 
accepts the evolutionary claim. So the third factor response begins by you know, asking, OK, what basic evaluative tendencies would be selected? And then um, it, it specifies certain basic evaluative tendencies that would be favored by natural selection, such as survival is good. And then it argues that these are true. And you know, they're, they're true per our moral judgments, right? So the third factor realist is testing the basic evaluative tendencies that would be selected against our intuitive moral judgments. But those intuitive moral judgments are themselves derived from basic evaluative tendencies that have been shaped by evolution. So Horn worries that actually, no, this is uh, objectionably circular. Um, as I say, you know, this argument is, it's, it's, I mean, it's one of those cases where it does get um, very tricky. I find, I find it sort of hard to keep all of the moving parts in mind. Like, I'm, so yeah, I, I hopefully, hopefully that was clear, um, uh, the, the kind of dialectic there. Um, okay, let's let's move on from from this and consider a second objection to third factor responses. This is suggested by Matthew Braddock in the article "Evolutionary Debunking: Can Moral Realists Explain the Reliability of Our Moral Judgments?" Um, actually, this point is not—I don't think it's exactly what Braddock was saying, but it's kind of inspired by him. So the uh, argument here is <coughs> the objection here is that the trouble with third factor responses, such as Enochs and Cops, is that even if their evolutionary claims are correct, right, the basic evaluative tendencies produced will be compatible with a host of very different moral norms. Um, Braddock notes that they are compatible with uh, what he calls nasty norms. Consider the norm that it is permissible for members of our community to kill, exploit and enslave other members, uh, members of other communities. This is an internally cooperative norm. It promotes cooperation and stability within the group, but it encourages, uh, because it encourages group members to work together. Um, indeed, it might actually be a very powerful source of encouragement. Um, you know, one way to unite a people is to unite them against an outsider. So by acting on this norm, the group will work together on a project, they'll increase their resources, expand their territory, eliminate potential competition, and so on. Um, now, so that's that's like one one type of norm. It's a nasty norm, right? But it's it's pro-social. It's cooperative. So clearly, there's a huge diversity of pro-social norms. And moreover, we know that nasty norms like this have been prevalent in different societies. And we know that the evolutionary processes leading to the acceptance of these nasty norms are the same as the evolutionary processes uh, leading to our norms. You know, all humans have basically the same. All humans have pretty much the same basic evaluative tendencies. If our basic evaluative tendencies could easily have led to completely different norms, well, that raises concerns about their reliability. Um, another example along similar lines is uh, again given by Justin Horn. So take Enoch's claim that survival is good. Grant everything Enoch says. So grant that it's a moral fact that survival is pro tanto good. Well, it may also be a moral fact that the beauty of nature is of far greater value and that in most circumstances we are obligated to sacrifice our own welfare and even survival to promote natural beauty. Obviously, if we were to accept this, we would have a dramatically different system of, moral, of, of norms. So our actual moral system incorporates the norm survival is good. And you know we have an account of how the evolution of our basic evaluative tendencies could track the truth on that particular issue. But there are a variety of radically alternative moral systems that also incorporate survival is good. And we can give an evolutionary explanation of why we don't accept those alternative systems. I mean, clearly it would not promote reproductive success to sacrifice our interests in order to maximize the beauty of nature. But survival is good. That's compatible with both. Um, so, you know, I, I guess that the worry is this. The third factor responses given by Enoch and Kopp try to show that our basic evaluative tendencies will point us in the right direction, even though they've been inculcated by evolution. Survival is good, points us in the right direction. And then we can rely on rational reflection to do the rest. The worry here is that actually the tendencies identified by Enoch and Kopp are just not strict enough to uh, ensure reliability. The the, the, the basic evaluative tendencies identified by Enoch and Kopp point in all sorts of directions. Um, the third factor doesn't restrict our basic evaluative tendencies strongly enough. Um, 
So, you know, to return to the Bermuda analogy, the situation is like setting off from the UK in a southwesterly direction and then leaving it to the wind and tides to get you to Bermuda. Well, that's better than setting off to the north, but you're still unlikely to make it to, uh, to Bermuda. So yeah, the, the, like, you know, survival is good, right? That's just, um, that's just not strong enough um, for us to be confident that our, uh, our, our moral beliefs are reliable. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, that's the evolutionary debunking argument. Um, I hope you found that interesting, and that is all for today. Goodbye.